Hear these words from Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Hear also these words from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-9. through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be refound to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not yet seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As is often the case in the letters that are written in the latter portion of our New Testament, we find a person writing to a church who is in a particular circumstance. And as is often in the early church, this particular circumstance is a circumstance of either uncertainty or difficulty or strife or confusion or infighting because these letters were written often to help resolve an issue that was going on in the church. In the case of 1 Peter, it is being written to a church that is afraid, a church that is in many ways in danger, a church that is unsure about whether they should continue to practice their faith because of the situation that they're involved in. In this particular case, we're talking about the persecution and the um, the word diaspora that's used in the beginning of 1 Peter uh, in the verses before our reading where Jews uh, who are now believing in Christ have been kind of run out of town by the rulers, have been uh, spread apart, have been locked in their homes, they're no longer able to gather in the way that they wanted to and they are unsure as to whether they can continue to practice their faith. Uh, should they start hiding in society? Should they start meeting less together to become a little less obvious? Uh, is this thing that they have been practicing and sharing this faith about, is this even worth what they're going through? And so this letter is being written to a people in a particular circumstance that most often, and as a commentary uh, that I read on this passage said, we are not aware of, we are not in the midst of, we are not um, understanding of. And yet this is written and this is come up in a time 
where we might just be closer to understanding what's going on. We're understanding the the feeling that we've been spread apart and flung apart and driven apart and we're unsure what the practice of our faith is going to look like. Are we, do we continue going to church when church re, reorganizes and where this uh, stay at home order is lifted? How does church look? Uh, is it okay if I stay at home and don't do these things that we normally did? How do I continue to practice my faith in the midst of all of this? And yet, in the midst of a similar circumstance, the advice from the writer of 1 Peter is, you have indescribable joy in the midst of all of this. Sometimes, just like when Paul writes some of his letters from prison and he uses words like joy in the midst of trials and joy in the midst of suffering, it seems like it's counterintuitive. How can I have this joy in the midst of what I'm going through? How can I have this joy when I'm afraid for my health, afraid for my life, afraid for the lives of those around me, unsure what I'm supposed to be doing? How can I have this joy, this joy that is reflected in our psalm reading? A psalm that says there is a lot going on out in the world, people who aren't faithful to you, O Lord, and yet I will be faithful and I will consider it joy to be a part of what you're doing in my life. And so these two scriptures combine in a, just this perfect envelope for our situation right now. A situation where everything outside of us seems to say, there's no need to meet, there's no need to worship, no, you don't have to listen to those sermons on Sunday, you don't have to listen to those recordings, you don't have to go back to church when the churches reopen, how will you even do that? Those, those thoughts that are nagging at us from the culture, from our own minds, those are the thoughts that are, like I said, just brought together in this one perfect package in this scripture, in these scriptures. The concept that the world is going to do a lot of different things than what we are going to do as Christians. And the world at times is almost going to be dangerous to Christians. And sometimes that's physical danger caused by other people and sometimes that's the danger of situations that are going on outside of our control. Because of that, we have this promise and this suggestion from the writer of 1 Peter that says, consider the joy of what you have. Now, he goes on to promise them that the faith that they're practicing is going to protect them from what's going on. Now, he's not saying that the faith that they're practicing is going to physically protect them. It didn't even physically protect the risen Lord, but it is going to guard their hearts. It is going to guard their souls. Practicing the faith is how we withstand the difficulties that life is throwing at us. Instead of what the people were concerned about, based on the context of this letter, it appears to be concerned about whether they should stop practicing the faith so that they didn't have to deal with the struggles of the world, or whether doing something that kind of blended them in with the world would be more beneficial to their own spiritual health. The words that we receive and that they receive from the writer of the letter says the exact opposite. It is the joy and the practice and the knowledge of the faith that you have that is going to keep you and guard your spirit and your heart and your souls through the midst of this. If you give up on your faith, there's no point in and even really, in the way the, that First Peter writes this, there's no really even point in, in living. And the psalmist reflects that image. There, there's no point in doing anything if you give up on the faith. 
And so the, the words to the people who are receiving this letter are saying to their hearts and to their lives and to their situations, yes, the trials that you are in are difficult. And God is letting us experience these, not so that our faith falters, but so that our faith carries us through these situations. It seems a little difficult, particularly in this time, to think about joy, to think about praising God, to think about happiness in, in our sense of the word, to think about this almost pleasurable understanding of God's image in our lives, God's want for our lives, God's desire for our lives, it seems hard to imagine that in the midst of all of this. And yet, just like those who read the words first, we are challenged to be joyful in the midst of difficulty. We're challenged to hold to that joy, to the faith that brings that joy, so that when we come out of this, we come out of this stronger in the faith, stronger in knowing who we are and our identity in Christ. Often after Easter is celebrated, we have a tendency to kind of forget that joy. Easter happens and then we forget that for another 50 days we actually celebrate the season of Easter. We had 40 days of Lent where we led up to this time of Easter and where it was a time of darkness and introspection, but the 50 days after Easter are specifically, specifically aimed at rejoicing and celebrating that Easter time. And so let us not particularly in this season, lose that joy of the resurrected Christ, lose that joy of the promise that we have been given, lose that joy in the midst of difficulty. Like those to whom the letter of 1 Peter was written, we understand the temptation to fall away from our faith practices, particularly when we're no longer able to gather in the way that we had been previously. And yet the author and the author of the psalm as well encourage us that giving up on our faith is far from what's going to help us in the long run. It's being true to that faith and finding that joy in our lives, even in the midst of difficulty, especially in the midst of difficulty, that sustains us through and protects our hearts and minds and souls throughout all of this difficult time. The psalmist makes it clear that there are other things in the world, other gods in the world, other images in the world that would tempt his faith in God. And yet he says, the only name on my lips is yours, O Lord. In this time of difficulty where we might be lapsing into not understanding and not being able to get our minds around how we worship apart, as this time drags on, as we have more questions than we have answers, we are encouraged by our scriptures this day to be sustained by the joy that we have in our Lord, to be sustained through this time of trial by the knowledge that God is present with us, is our risen Christ, as First Peter says, present with us here and now. And so let us take this promise into our times of worship of God here in our homes, into our times of study of God, and into the times that we can be God, particularly as we begin to look toward the loosening of some of the restrictions. How can we begin to be the risen Christ? How can we take that joy that we have felt in Easter and share it with the world? 
How can we be that risen Christ to the community around us, particularly in our very diverse settings? The letter written to the early church, the letter that is voiced by Peter, the man who made almost all the wrong decisions when Christ was alive, is finally understanding and saying to those that he is teaching that God is more than we imagined, more than I could have imagined when I was walking with him. God has the power to sustain us even in the midst of difficulty. This is the voice of Peter, Peter the one who took off the minute there was difficulty. The one who sank in the waves when there was fear and difficulty. The one who opened his mouth so often and had to put his own foot in it. In the Bible, this is the voice of Peter saying, the God that I walked with on the earth is bigger than I could have ever imagined, and he is our joy even in the midst of difficulty. He's advising these people, probably from a very understanding, personal standpoint, to not turn away in the midst of difficulty, to not fall from the faith. And so at this time, as we are separated from one another, as we are experiencing what the early church has experienced, may we be supported by the joy of Christ. May we share the joy of Christ. May the joy of Christ surround us, this promise that he is risen and it is this promise that will carry us through all that we are going through. Blessings on the week ahead. May you find new places to discover God's joy in your life. Amen.